My name is Sir Sir Bernard, Bernard, creator of the Infinite Songbook. Thank you for your interest. These are the video instructions. What is Infinite Songbook? Infinite Songbook is a unique song building card game designed to make ordinary people into amazing musicians. Amazing musicians into master composers and master composers into ordinary people. Now you're asking yourself, how can one simple card game do all of this? And it's because it has four different game modes, allowing it to be a learning tool, a composition tool, and a jam out catalyst. Like a conventional songbook, the infinite songbook requires the use of musical instruments. But unlike a conventional songbook, the infinite songbook inspires you to write your own songs, to play music with friends, and to develop and apply a mental visualization which will help one to write melodies and solo with a visual geometric understanding of music theory. Use Acolyte mode of Infinite Songbook to teach yourself one of or all five of the following instruments. Guitar, ukulele, mandolin, banjo, and piano. Be a beginner again. And as a quick motivational side note, do not limit yourself with the word talent. Skills are learned through experience, in other words, the amount of time doing the thing, awareness while doing the thing, interest in that thing, the physical ability to execute the task, and finally a framework or a teaching to process what is happening. This is all limited by your tendency to repeat yourself and any notions that you are an expert. So we can clearly see using that equation that skill equals talent and talent is now a dirty word and skill is the preferred nomenclature. Use oracle mode to further develop your musical skills by expanding your chord knowledge by playing faded chord progressions. The infinite songbook reaches full actualization in sorcerer mode where you use your musical sensibilities to bend fate and alter this chord progression but not only altering it, you can layer other progressions on top of it, you can add in lyrics, beats, melodies, other intros and outros, basically making it into a compositional tool. Use shaman mode to provide a non-territorial starting point for a conversational style group jam. Build musical courage, hone the ear, wander the jamscape, usher in a new era of musical enlightenment, unprecedented brain growth, and interplanetary peace. Use the Mighty Noodle Crutch to visually and intuitively understand music theory. It's a musical mandala, which I believe to be the actual philosopher's stone, which is said to have the ability to transmute lead into gold. The Infinite Songbook will become a lifelong companion on your journey in music as it becomes a permanent fixture in your instrument case. Before we discuss the game modes at depth, Let's take a moment to examine the deck itself. Upon opening the Pandora's box of the Infinite Songbook, one will notice a sheet of paper with very tiny words printed upon it, eight Noodle Crutch cards, 48 chord cards, and 16 play cards. The paper instructions show the card anatomy, the game modes, and a visual way to think about music. They were painstakingly edited and reworked to near perfection. The Noodle Crutch cards should be gathered up and removed from the deck. Later, they will become a powerful tool to help you navigate the sonic seas. Once you cut them up, they will become more powerful than you can ever imagine. Now, looking through the Infinite Songbook, notice that there are four suits containing 12 cards each. The stones, the spirals, the sevens, and the minors, and 16 play cards. Each card may appear to have an overwhelming amount of information on it, but one should remember that they only need to look at the information for their instrument. Each chord card has five chord brackets or symbols which show how to play that particular chord on each of the five featured instruments. 
vertical lines represent strings, left line the lowest, and the horizontal lines represent frets. The guitar has six verticals, the ukulele four verticals, mandolin has four double verticals, the banjo has four, sometimes five verticals with bold outside edges. The X means don't play that string. The tiny numbers indicate which fret to begin the chord shape on. There are usually a few different ways to play the same chord on a given instrument, and I try to include some less known shapes to encourage more learning, but if this is difficult or annoying, play the chord however you want. Filled circles indicate the position of the scale notes. Open circles with letters inside them indicate the note produced. They are the one, three, five tones of the stated mode. In two of the suits, the spirals and the stones, the 12 major chords are represented. In the sevens, the 12 sevens chords are represented. In the minors, the 12 minor chords are shown. So that gives the Infinite Songbook a composition of one half major chords, one quarter minor chords, and one quarter sevens chords. The spiral suit features a logarithmically compressed diagram of the vibrational staircase with a hertz scale next to it and notes with stacking octaves. The stones suit features different aspects of the common stone which produce all of its possible modes and the corresponding one, three, five major or minor triads. The seven suit features a mixolydian mode of the common stone and show magnifications of chord locations on fretboards. The minor suit features three minor modes of the common stone and a few completely different minor stones altogether. All cards include a complete fretboard of the guitar and thus the bass two for that card and an image of the noodle crutch turned to that mode and key. At this point, I'm going to encourage those already familiar with the anatomy of an instrument to skip ahead to the description of oracle mode. Beginners, don't worry. In acolyte mode, we'll start off nice and slow. Part one, acolyte mode. In acolyte mode, the Infinite Songbook is a kindly teacher, allowing beginners to learn an instrument at their own speed in easily digestible bits. Remembering that interest and fun are very important motivators to help us spend more time with a given instrument. Begin by tuning up. Use an electric tuner or a tuning fork. As a beginner, it's not completely imperative that you understand exactly what's going on here, but having an instrument that's in tune when you're a beginner is a very important thing because otherwise it will never sound good. And it sounding beautiful is a pretty good motivator for you to keep exploring the capabilities of that instrument. So again, very important to be in tune. The standard tuning for the guitar is E, A, D, G, B, E. The ukulele is G, C, E, A. The mandolin is G, D, A, E. And the banjo is G, D, G, B, D. But these names aren't really important right now for you to remember, except for, again, you want to be able to tune your instrument to have it sound really nice. Our brains have different networks of activity which process reality in their own idiosyncratic ways. And the general tendency while learning music is to use the naming and numbering part of our mind. This is not wrong. It's just not the greatest starting point. I have realized that there's another processing part of the mind that I call the medulla jamaigata, and that is a part of the mind that is more visual, spatial. It is a brilliant pattern recognition savant that has no need to name anything. So let's use this as a starting point instead so we can foster flow and creativity to fan the flame of fun to learn a new thing. Nylon strings of a classical guitar and a ukulele are easier on your fingertips for a beginner, but metal strings are louder. Over time, calluses should start to form, making it easier to play for longer durations. Start by exploring the anatomy of your instrument 
by playing one string at a time. Then maybe try randomly pressing down on a spot on a fret to make that string shorter and to make a different note. On the piano, it's much easier to produce a beautifully sounded note. Make sounds. Try to understand what is happening. Listen to the way that the tone generated is vibrating the atmosphere around you. Explore the situation with your awareness. Now begin by playing a single note like a drum. Use a pick, or don't. Choose a tempo, and store it in your bobbing head. Play out a groovy beat on that note. All musical instruments are drums, so pianos and strings can be thought of as complex drums of many tones. Add another note or two to the cycling drum beat by pressing down a different spot to create a different toned drum. Create visual shapes on the fretboard. Play one, skip one, make a square. Loop your new song with consistency. There you go, jamming. And that really is the essence of it. But these five instruments are complex and can make chords which are made up of multiple sounds harmonizing. For example, a C chord has a C in it at its root, but it has other notes, an E and a G, which highlight and complement the C. Just as there are only 12 notes in their octaves possible in our music system, there are only 12 chords, basic major chords, possible in our music system. In Acolyte mode, chord cards are simply used to teach you these 12 chord shapes. So let's isolate one of the two major suits, the spirals. Let's pull out the 12 spiral cards, and from those 12, pull out these five cards. A, C, D, E, and G. Once you can sound a chord, listen to its power. Let it ring. Then try to learn another chord. Play it with rhythm and try to strum it. Learn to play these chords one at a time in whatever order seems best for you. These five chords are going to get you about half the way there, uh, maybe further than half the way there. Try to play it as cleanly as you can and then strum it and try to play it like it was a drum. And you'll find there's different, you can use parts of your palm on your strumming hand to mute it if it gets too ringy out of control. You can also kind of throb the pressure of your fingers when you're pressing the chord and that can also help to mute the strings. So once you can dance the chord around with a little rhythm, you can jump around to a different chord with rhythm like you did with the single string, but now you're doing that same thing using chords. And as you learn these five chords, it gives you more points more chord transitions you can jump from one to the other. Fun and creativity drive learning. Again, to read chord brackets, see the vertical lines are strings and the horizontal lines represent the frets. The guitar symbol shows six vertical strings, the ukulele has four vertical strings, the mandolin four double strings, and the banjo has four strings, sometimes five with bold edges, to differentiate it from the ukulele. They'll always appear in that same order. Guitar, ukulele, mandolin, banjo. Let's look at the sevens suit, and I have little drawings of each instrument with blow ups and then the chord bracket. So you can kind of use a little detective work and figure out if you forget which chord brackets are which. Okay, the topmost horizontal line in a chord bracket represents the nut, which I've made slightly bolder than the other frets on the chord brackets. Most chords begin here. But if a chord begins on a fret further up the neck, it will have a tiny number next to the bracket to indicate which fret to start on. These will be basically most of the harder barred chords. The circles on the brackets show where to press your fingers to produce that particular chord. Looking closer, one can read the note produced by pressing in that location. Or if it's behind the nut line, it will show the note created by that open string. Of course, one should strum or pluck the strings of an instrument to produce a chord. Usually, it's all of the strings, but sometimes a string is omitted. If that string is omitted, the chord bracket will show a tiny X to tell you not to play that string. And for now, ignore the other stuff on the cards. So look at the other seven cards in the spiral suit and do the same thing to familiarize yourself with those chord shapes. Most bar chords are derived from one of those five 
chord shapes you've already learned with the bar behind it, with the nut artificially placed behind it by your the human capo. The your pointer finger becomes the nut, and then you play a familiar shape further up, and that is the barred chord. You'll see that various instruments prefer different root chord shapes for their barred chords. The guitar really likes the E shape and the A shape. The ukulele likes its C chord shape and its A chord shape and its D chord shape and G shape. A lot of bars for the uke. Uh, the mandolin likes its C chord bar and its F chord bar and uh, maybe arguably others. The banjo loves the G and the F and maybe the D shape in its bars. Once you're ready to move on, learn some basic variations on those 12 chords by adding the spiral suits back into the entire deck and shuffling it. Then draw a single card from the deck. If it is a play card, marvel at its clunky esoteric strangeness and draw again. Repeat the process by drawing another card and then play that new card on your instrument. At any point in acolyte mode, one is encouraged to take time to play these learned chords rhythmically and build your own songish patterns by oscillating these chord forms from one to another. Undergoing this process will take time, discipline, awareness, but it's worth it. It is not necessary to learn every chord in this way. But the next phase of the game is undertaken in the flow of time, which waits for no one. Part 2, Oracle Mode. Begin here if you can already play chords on an instrument. In Oracle Mode, the forces of fate will call upon you to play and hear a predestined chord sequence. The same divinary forces are enacted here as in the tossing of the bones, the casting of the I Ching, the turning of the tarot, and the gazing into a crystal ball. The Infinite Songbook is shuffled, and the cards are picked from the deck until a play card is drawn. The chord cards will function as words in a musical sentence, and the play cards will serve as the punctuation, ending the sentence. Then the phrase loops. Your fate has led you to a progression. In playing it, you'll hear intervals between chords you may never have heard. You will come across chords unfamiliar to you, which fate will have you now play. There are 48 chord cards and 16 play cards, which should average about three chords per looping progression. That is, if the play cards are evenly distributed throughout the deck. If they are clumped together, however, it may result in ridiculously long progressions. It's advised to take a quick glance and separate any play cards that may be clumped together. Now, shuffle again and draw cards until a play card is drawn. Then stop. If a play card is drawn first, look at it, decode it, and then discard it and draw again. Now, looking at this progression, choose a tempo and put it in your tapping foot. Then begin to play, giving each card the same amount of beats, four or eight, or however many is comfortable to allow you enough time to play each chord cleanly. Once the play card is reached, loop back and play it through again, this time cleaner and more timely. It will get easier as you play. Once you get the sequence, break free from the tediousness of equal timing and use your best judgment to shorten or lengthen chord durations to make a tasty groove. If only one card is drawn before a play card, play that card in time for four to eight beats, then play a solo or melody in that mode and key for four to eight beats, then back to the chord again to tie it back down. Use the noodle crutch image on the card to see a map of notes playable for that mode and key. The noodle crutch will show which seven notes out of the 12 possible are good to play along with that root chord. Fate will generate some great phrases, but inevitably there will be some chords that just feel wrong or out of place. This brings us to the next phase of the Infinite Songbook. Part 3, Sorcerer Mode. The Infinite Songbook reaches its full potential in Sorcerer Mode, where it is now time to use our minds to bend fate and flex our musical sensibilities. Shuffle and draw cards until a play card is hit. You'll be amazed at the majesty and elegance of many of these progressions, but some will sound sour. Making the smallest possible changes to fix the sequence is the aim of this phase. There are a number of things that can be done to change a progression, and nothing is completely out of the question, 
but try and make the smallest possible correction. Be like an old martial artist who uses the slightest movement or shift of weight to deflect or reverse various lethal attacks. Rearrange, add, and remove. Do what you have to do. The rules are tight in oracle mode, forcing one to learn uncomfortable chords and chord transitions, but they loosen in sorcerer mode, which allows you to develop your own creative methods to generate interesting chord progressions using the Infinite Songbook. If it still needs something, initiate another round of drawing until another play card is hit. Use these new cards to complement and complicate your progression. Try and work them in somehow. If some don't fit, set them aside, remembering you can change anything you want, but to try and change as little as possible. What you have created now can function as a protoverse for a fledgling composition. By rearranging some of these cards, you can create a variation on your original progression and create a chorus for your song. Or by drawing one more card and working that into the progression. Or by using a card that's been set aside and weaving that into the progression. Or by reinitiating a whole new random progression and weaving that into your song to create intros, outros, choruses, interludes. You can just set unused cards aside and continue drawing or you may choose to write down your progression, allowing for total reshuffling of the deck. Also remember that there are many other chord variations that should be considered and applied. Maybe you'll just use Infinite Songbook to discover a single interesting chord juxtaposition and apply that to a song you're already writing, or maybe just to provide a starting point to write the rest of the song on your own, unassisted by the wisdom of the Infinite Songbook. To see the Infinite Songbook in action, Check out my podcast, Cirque Learns Music. Most of the time, verses come and go from the Infinite Songbook without there being any record of their passing. But occasionally, one may discover such a gem that you are compelled to write it down and possibly flesh it out into something a little bit more of a song. It may be thought of as a bone structure for an incubating metaphysical song creature. You may want to record it if you're playing alone, and then over the top, use your creativity and musical faith to meander out a melody, like musculature over bone. If you want, give it a brain by writing a intelligent refrain. Give it hair and skin and digestion. Maybe add accordion? Okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves and forget the creature's heart. In fact, it works better if that's where we start. Give your song a heartbeat. Without that, it's just a pile of ghostly meat. Okay, enough rhyming. If you're playing with a friend in sorcerer mode, someone can be the mule holding down the chord progression generated by the infinite songbook, while somebody else can meander around and noodle out a melody over the top in that same mode and key. As beautiful as your beloved song creature is, it may be appropriate to destroy it and start again if it lacks a certain survivability. Once one begins to feel a rhythm and develop a relationship to the Infinite Songbook, one may find themselves more interested in noodling around with the cards than playing songs of others. Bad progressions are quickly identified and altered or thrown away. Good progressions might be discovered and enjoyed, then be discarded with the same abandoned as bad ones, mainly due to the excitement of hearing the next progression that the cards have to offer. Some may even toy with the idea of transcending the necessity to repeat any song twice. This growing familiarity with the Infinite Songbook will initiate the participant for the final phase. Part 4. Shaman Mode The final modality of the Infinite Songbook begins as all the rest. The only difference is all of the other musicians present. In these instances, I have found that there is an intense urge for musicians to play the accumulated songs in their musical quivers. This can lead to various problems. Use the Infinite Songbook as a non-territorial starting point for a group musical conversation. Discreetly unfurl the cards until a play card is drawn. Quick adjustments are made by the practitioner of the Infinite Songbook. This can be done by creatively altering the cards intelligently and intuitively in the same way that you normally do while you play Infinite Songbook alone. Some people continue to hold it down, while others can then noodle around and discover different musical strands. After a bit, draw another card and work that into the room. In time, the Infinite Songbook can be completely forgotten. As you begin listening to each other and interacting, 
having a musical conversation, unplanned, you will experience a magic that borders on telepathic. Another possibility occurs when a play card is drawn first in shaman mode. It signals a percussive groove where all musicians temporarily set down their corded instruments, finding the tempo together, and become drummers on anything in their surrounding environment, remembering to be respectful and not break anything. Agree on a steady tempo and join in the groove, using intuitive multiplications and divisions of that tempo and creating looping percussive phrases, but still respecting the beauty and importance of empty spaces. When it feels like time, begin to use the instruments in tempo with the drum jam. Staying on beat is arguably the most important part of music. So once this loop is joined by the rest of the room, fun deviations begin to occur. It's essential that some mules find a looping chord pattern, allowing others to explore cycles and patterns of sound around it. The mule's boredom with repetition should inspire some sort of evolution carrying the thing far away from where it originated. People will begin to communicate with rhythm and tone, surprising themselves and others with unplanned synchronicity. In this phase of Infinite Songbook, it is used as a raft to be abandoned once the rivers of self-consciousness and musical hesitation have been crossed. It will have succeeded if it can serve as a simple point of departure for a group jam that is not a song. Songs have a dangerous gravity which can pull players into lasting cycles of repetition. Use the Infinite Songbook to break these cycles and catalyze musical growth in yourself and others. Part 5. The Noodle Crutch. The Noodle Crutch cards contain four different versions of the common stone plus 27 other stones. What's a stone? What's a noodle crutch? A stone is a geometric representation of a scale. Like the Ouroboros, a circle is produced when it eats its own tail. The mighty noodle crutch is a dynamic tool providing a relative framework to interpret a given stone. It is a visual guide to help your noodle, your brain, to noodle, wander the jamscape. It is a map to help you sail the sonic seas musically it is an organizational rack on which to hang musical concepts. It is a kinetic mandala for a visual and geometric understanding of modes and music theory in general. I believe it to be the historic philosopher's stone, allowing its beholder to transmute the musical lead of rote memorization into the musical gold of flow states initiated by a geometric understanding of musical forms. The power to use music magically. Leonardo da Vinci was an alchemist, a free thinker, an engineer, and a problem solver. Leonardo da Vinci, interested in the occult, traveling elite circles, not very keen on Christianity, in fact, thought to have been part of some secret societies. He loved to solve and create puzzles, and he loved music. He even wrote his notebooks backwards using a simple mirror cipher codifying his text. Most argue this is too easy to decipher, and thus, not an attempt to code anything, but most likely because Leonardo da Vinci was left-handed, and as he wrote ink, he ink would spread across the paper, so he wanted to write in reverse to keep ink from spreading on the paper. Now that's an okay theory. Could have been a breadcrumb. Could have been something else. Hey, there might be other codes encoded. It is possible Leonardo da Vinci himself has deciphered the Philosopher's Stone, or belonged to some alchemical order that was teaching the Philosopher's Stone. He may have even left us a powerful tool for understanding music in his notes. Before we get into that, we must take a trip down the spiral tubes of the Circle Cipher, which will reveal the logic that leads us to the mighty Noodle Crutch. The traditional linear diagonal musical staircase is sucked into the apparatus. As it moves through, the cipher's tubes gently untwist the line back into its natural shape of a spiral. Looking closer, we see that there are 12 steps per flight, with the 13th step being the same note as the first, located directly above and below it. Musical octaves stack over and under one another, allowing us to treat them as each other. Now, picturing this spiral staircase directly from below, see it compress into a two-dimensional dodecahedron, the chromatic stone, with 12 stations, 
one for each possible chromatic note. Place this chromatic dodecahedron on a clock face that has the one on the top instead of the 12. So the key or the tonic will be whichever note is aligned under the one at the top. Then it becomes the beginning and end point for a given scale or progression. It's a musical home bass, the tonic throne. If we turn the chromatic stone so that the C is beneath the one, then technically we will be in the key of C. If we draw a line to each of the seven notes in the C major scale, it will produce this geometric shape, which I have good reason to believe is the real philosopher's stone from alchemical lore. To make of a man and a woman a circle, then a quadrangle. Out of this, a triangle. Make again a circle, and you will have the stone of the wise. Thus is made the stone which thou canst not discover unless you, through diligence, learn to understand this geometric teaching. From the famous alchemist Michael Myers' book. But as an effort to avoid megalomaniacish pretensions, and since it creates all the seven-tone scales which we are already familiar with, I think maybe we can just call this the common stone instead of the philosopher's stone. I call any shape made by applying the logic of a circle to a given scale a stone. And any stone can be placed upon the noodle crutch. The noodle crutch cards contain four five-tone stones. That's one mode for each corner. That's 20 modes there. Four six-tone stones. That's 24 modes. 14 seven-tone stones. That's 98 modes. And six eight-tone stones. That's 48 modes. That's 28 separate stones with the cumulative 190 different modes between them. If you multiply that by the 12 possible keys, you get 2,280 scales compressed into the eight noodle crutch cards. But don't despair. Most of modern music uses only two or three corners of one stone, the common stone. There is undue confusion surrounding modes, but this is not unreasonable. The great Leonardo da Vinci is said to have remarked, And you who think to reveal the figure of a man, or in our case, music, in words, with his limbs arranged in their different attitudes, banish this idea from you. For the more minute your description, the more you will confuse the mind of the reader and lead him away from the thing being described. It is necessary for you to represent and to describe. So, if we then add in some strange Greek labels to the names of these modes, which we don't have an adequate visual representation, it further confuses the mind. But look, the common stone is a symmetrical, two-dimensional geometric shape, with corners having fixed relative positions. It is, as Leonardo da Vinci suggests, a shape that works as a representation that you can use to relate these musical descriptions to. These corners each have their own name and musical personality. There is the Ionian mode, which most people know as the major scale, the Dorian mode, the Phrygian mode, the Lydian mode, the Mixolydian mode, the Aeolian mode, what most people call the minor scale, and the Locrian mode. So looking through culture for a shape, I stumbled across you guessed it, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Vitruvius was a famous architect who presented the notion that the perfection of the human body can be described by a square and a circle. In the margins of da Vinci's famous drawing, he quotes Vitruvius backwards in Italian. But he breaks the rules that he quotes right there on the page. Perhaps instead, it was a sneaky drawing of the philosopher's stone as described by the alchemists and cleverly disguised as a rendition of the Vitruvian Man. Leonardo da Vinci had an alchemical tendency to secretly mix a balance of feminine into his art. The Last Supper features Mary sitting next to Jesus. The Mona Lisa might possibly be a self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci's female shadow side. But even if I am wrong about this, his Vitruvian man drawing makes a great mental image to help us to remember the shape of the common stone, providing a framework to remember the modes in relation to one another. So let's use da Vinci's drawing as an alternative linguistic model for the organization of the seven modes of the common stone. And by the way, the Vitruvian man, if you think of it as the philosopher's stone, there will be 
the man is in front and a super buffed out woman is behind the man in front and it's actually two different people not one man articulating but a, a man in front and a woman in back making it fit the description of a philosopher's stone drawing man in front on the square and woman behind the man on the circle Ionian mode or her right hand Dorian mode their heads Phrygian mode her left hand, Lydian mode, his left hand, Mixolydian mode, her left foot, Aeolian mode, her right foot, and the Locrian mode is his hand. Cut the noodle crutch cards up and build your own noodle crutch. There are a bunch of very cool uses for the noodle crutch. It is actually the most powerful part of this whole infinite songbook mess. The noodle crutch can be used to see the available tones in each mode and what notes in any key that they correspond to. It can be used to recognize interval distances from the tonic throne to any other note in that key. For example, you can find the fifth of an A sharp instantly by looking at the noodle crutch. To help compose intelligent movements through scales, helping to solo and create melodies in proper keys with ease. Or on the next level of the fractal, it can help you to compose intelligent movements through the keys using your new grasp of intervals. You can use it as a translator. For instance, if in the E Doric mode, you can play the Mixolydian pattern on an A string or the Aeolian pattern on a B string by rolling the stone. Uh, if you invert the stone and roll it down the fretboard of your mind, it will show you what notes you need to play. Another thing that you can do is mount an uncommon stone to the noodle crutch and explore those modes and scales. It has been observed through history that each mode of a given scale can inspire different emotional reactions within ourselves and others. The tools to explore these musical wonders are now yours. For more information, visit infinitesongbook.com. The songbook is a game for normal people, like me and you, people with normal hairdos. No, actually, it's a game for just people like me with awesome hairdos. But if you're like me with an awesome hairdo, you might enjoy the Infinite Songbook.